Anybody can answer this question? I, I don't think it's, it's necessary for the viewer to have suffered in the way that the person is, is just the, the, the suffering from the, the, the in, initial idea. Sharing that compassion, so you're yeah. suffering again, and so you're not, you get rid of suffering. Cool. It's not, it sounds like it's got the, um, the contradiction again, to yeah. have the ability to have enjoy this art, the artist has uh, to suffer. See, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can't have this pathway if everyone, if the artist doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. Okay, the idea of, of pardon, sorry. That's the denial of the will because you detach from your own will that you feel you, you, you are like not suffer, not because uh, someone else uh, suffer for you, well, but you detached from this kind of your, oh yeah, your you, own you, will. So you, you are saying you, that to gain a a higher level of compassion requires taking in you know genius level art, but to have a genius level art, you need to have a genius who has to suffer. So it just goes round and round. Yeah. Okay, genius does suffer, right? But it suffers for all of us. Because there is a difference when you look at the, at the, at the art. There is the creation of art, and this is understanding of art, or contemplation, from the, from the um, spectator. So genius creates, spectator consumes. You don't go to the museum in order to suffer. You go it for a relief. Happen. It does happen. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but it didn't happen to me, so maybe. But well, you when, you, when you listen Mozart, it can happen. That it can happen, suffer. exactly. <laughs> Emotional, yes, yes, exactly. That's yeah, there's a difference between the emotions that are that exactly. arise out of the art versus, you know, you know why you can, yeah, experiencing you it, going through the same experience of creating the art. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's a catharsis, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I but you can also cry when you when you listen. Um, Madame Butterfly or something, opera or like that, and the whole thing is just going to take you away. It's a tragedy, basically. But you're not suffering. You're relieving yourself. This is, this is catharsis. This is purification. Aristotle talks about purification of two feelings, pity and fear. So when you get them right. out of yourself, you are relieved. Yeah. So uh, and this is the genius that does then, no? Well, we not genius, not necessarily. How do you know? Well, according <laughs> to Schopenhauer, I don't. I'm just trying to connect <laughs> to a different world. Yeah, to me, because I, I don't know if we can say that every genius suffers in that way. Do they? Well, this was Schopenhauer's. This is his definition? Yes, of genius. yes. Okay. Because of, of sheer disparity between the world of genius and the rest of us. Because he is not an individual. He, he, tried, he is in, the, in that uh, constantly eternal mm -hmm. world of ideas. He spent most of the time there. He's not all the time there. He, when he bounces back as an individual, he's literally lost in space. I've known a few, few artists like that in my lifetime, and th those people, they won't be able to sit here two minutes. They will just behave funny and they will walk. And I never, it, seriously, it's, it's just different, different breed of people. And they're constantly upset, taking to, 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 the, to, the, to the bone, that talent. It's just driving them on and on and on and on. It's not like, a, oh, I want to work eight hours today. No, they don't. They work all the time. It happens to me often. I, I wake up in the middle of the night and start writing something because in my dreams, I got some answers. <coughs> and that probably many people experienced that before. I mean, where do you draw the line of being a genius? Because there's a school of thought that child prodigies and generally it comes with mathematics and music, especially uh, because it's very related to music. And they have issues, in the, especially as children, because they're not accepted, they don't do things that other children do. Whereas in artists, on the other hand, are trying to express themselves, and you can argue that they are suffering because they're not expressing what they see in their, in their mind. And bringing back to Van Gogh, for example, now he's, for example, considered a genius, but during his time, he was a failed artist. It was a subjectivity of the time that changed and realized, okay, well, from now on, the water lilies are the peak of, of artistic expression, whereas at a time when he did it, 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 was, uh, it was a failure. So in a way, well, you can, you can uh, one of those uh, geniuses was, uh, that would defend your argument was Leonardo da Vinci. He was very rich, he was very uh, appreciated, respected artist. He would be welcome in, in 
and he wanted to like him to, to be in his company. So he actually uh, enjoyed the role, but there are also artists who are not. Michelangelo was always second grade. They lived at the same time as well. So one was 100% appreciated, and the other one was completely rejected and was fighting well, for approval. The argument approval. there would be that one of them was very uh, abstract, where one of them was painting what wanted to be painted and what didn't sort of uh, try to get ideas and colors into it. And that's, I think, that's the argument with Van Gogh as well. When you see the paintings from that period, mm -hmm. they're very, they're, they're portraits, they're things that people see. They're not expression of ideas and expression of colors and dreams, so to speak, that they're trying to, to, to paint. Well, Schopenhauer is very explicit on that subject. He says it has to be an expression of idea. He cannot be a, a, a painting which is uh, literally made to make money or become famous. That's not that. You can cherish it, but let's not do that. I mean, the, the statue of David is one of the most famous statues in the world. Mm. But it, it's not an idea. He's done it really, really well in a way that it shows the veins and stuff like that, which is something that artists today can do. No, that, is, that is a, a, a magnificent idea. David is not to do much about veins and muscles. and David no. is to do about determination, focusing. Uh, he, he, he looks at Goliath knowing that he's going to die if he doesn't do that strike perfectly with his uh, um, weapon. Sling, yeah? And this is the idea. This is the idea. Moses is not the idea of he is perfectly done physically, body, that's immaculate. But the idea is this is the man who suffers for his people. He's, he needs to take care of them because they're going to be slaughtered by Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Moses, this is the idea that he tries to give to the people, not necessarily the material uh, expression in the form of marble or, or painting or something. Starry Nights. Uh, when you mentioned Van Gogh, Van Gogh painted six, seven different um, uh, sunflowers. And the main reason why he done that, because when Paul Cezanne was supposed to visit him in his, in his little house in Normandy, wherever he was, the house was very, very poor, very small. There was nothing inside. So he painted six different uh, uh, sunflowers to make the house bright and to make Paul Cezanne welcome into his company. So this was the reason, because he has nothing else to do. He couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do anymore. So this is, this is, we cherish few of those probably. I don't know if you've seen all of them, yes? Sorry, I'll allow, can I have uh, another question? Of course. <laughs> well, when you mentioned about fear, so in Sublime. Sublime, yeah. So the fear is always related to sublime or not. So probably when we when we uh, uh, see a landscape, we feel uh, shocked, but we don't feel fear. So is the fear always related to sublime, or is just a part of the part of the uh, tragedy? Well, fear not not in the sense that something is going to happen to you, but fear that that you are absolutely nothing comparing to that in front of you. You understand? You are nothing. You are just a speck of dust, he said. And this is so vast and it's so huge. And then you realize that indi individually, you do don't make any sense. Doesn't uh, Nietzsche say that man is something that should be overcome? Which is... Yes, it's well, man is the bridge sense. between the ape and uh, Ubermensch. I, I wanted Uberman. to... Um, raise a couple of points. Um, one is this uh, relation between subjective and objective. Um, it's a huge theme, huge problem. Um, yeah. And I, I think it deserves a little bit more discussion. Yes, uh, especially please. since so many, you know, so much thought and, and so many theories have come after Schopenhauer's time. Uh, particularly structuralism and post-structuralism um, and you know where, where they, they accused those grand narratives like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and so on um, of, of, uh, you know, of being just that, a grand narrative and it doesn't um, take into account um, that every individual that exists within will will have a different experience different background, <coughs> different um, perception. 
uh, because of those experiences and backgrounds. And so uh, that's how we have, I feel, unfortunately, the, the birth of postmodernism, where if you have one artwork and all of us, you know, 30 of us here look at the same artwork, there will be 30 different um, opinions on it. And um, so then how can you say, let's say that artwork is created by a genius, how can you say that that artwork has an objective quality? Um, and, and for me, this is a very interesting thing, because um, not only as an artist, but also as, as you know, somebody who, who is interested in philosophy, um, that I, I realize that it is possible, not that what you said about Schopenhauer, um, it's, it's, it's valid, uh, that um, we can see objective values because they are objective ideas and these ideas are expressed in, in, in an artwork of a genius. But I think there's another way um, in that um, the perfection of, because you have art styles after Chopin's house life uh, period, so you have you know, expressionism and modernism and, and so on. And um, they are not necessarily representational. And you have what the British philosopher Collingwood would call uh, uh, art, art as pure expression. And that art doesn't have to be something recognizable. It can be evoking a, a feeling, a pure expression of an idea. And if that, <coughs> and that is essentially the subjective expression of, of the artist who created it. It's not objective. But uh, if that is done in a, a sincere way, it is, if it is a pure expression, then that perfection of subjectivity, that perfection of subjective expression becomes an objective quality. Well, uh, very good. Well, how, how, do you, how can you define perfection in that, that expression? When the artist doesn't think, like the gentleman said, if this artwork is going to sell, it, it, they are not aware of the audience. Uh, they are not in this dimension. They are geniuses who are you know, in, living in this eternal dimension of ideas. That is perfection. And, and if, when they manage to create something out of that state of mind, that is by default, by perfection of their subjective expression. I find it difficult the concept there of universalness to something. I mean, something like mathematics, which is a base purpose of reality. I can get how, you know, something like pi or something like that being represented. Yes, that's a universal truth. But everything else that's being shown is going to be affected by the culture that you exist in. So what you consider to be a universal concept to someone else may not be but people still find paintings Okay, I have to note to that. This is a good question, but it's not related to Schopenhauer, it's Immanuel Kant. <laughs> Kant speaks about... Um, Kant speaks about um, phenomena of subjective and universal, right? So in aesthetic contemplation, for Kant, Aesthetic contemplation is pure subjective uh, contemplation or inquiry. It has to be subjective, says Kant. Because subjective for Kant means free from every every influence. Subjective for Kant is just pure question. So means free from any influence, either political, cultural, or religious. Because only as such, as such subjective, free of any influence, that feeling can be universal. And that's your answer. You understand? Because it is purely subjective. It cannot be influenced by anybody or anything on any other cultural influence or religious or whatever. Therefore, 
is free for everybody. But the, the and it's automatically universal because it's, if it's subjective, it has to be universal. This is why his famous say in Kantian philosophy, especially his aesthetics, is called his subjective universality. Imagine, almost contradicting an adjective, but it's not. He talked about music as the highest form of art. Music, at least up until more recently, has always been experienced through a performer. Can the performer be a genius? Say Vladimir Horowitz. Okay. Would would would, would that call, for for Schopenhauer would Vladimir Horowitz be a genius? Could he be a genius? Well, Schopenhauer first of all lived in the time when they didn't have iPhones. Um, they have. Um, no, but you see these players, by whatever you'd have somebody performing. So exactly. So they, their understanding of art, you can only listen music if you go if you're wealthy, right? And if you can pay and go and listen to some performer, um, the concerts are the only way. That you, or unless you play music yourself, and he played flute as well. So uh, I don't know what Schopenhauer said about somebody else, but he was quite strict and explicit on, uh, on the subject of genius. And he is actually trying to help us understand how to take as much out of art as we can, because we should. He says that ability of aesthetic contemplation belongs to everybody. Everybody has it. What was interesting you were just saying now about everyone needing to be clones, because you just said earlier about the one about being in a bar and things. And I thought actually when you feel about it, individuality often reduces the amount of suffering because people want different things. You'll say, if you go into a bar and you want to chat and ten others, it's like, yeah, but there's other people. If everyone was the same, you would all be wanting the same thing continuously. You'd all want the same job at the job interview. So individuality often reduces the feeling of, um, of strife and conflict because you are all wanting different things. Absolutely, that I mentioned. This is totally opposite. I often say when I think, talk to people about different subjects, let's say arts and all that, and I say, oh, but who can say to me that I don't, I don't enjoy this picture the same as you or even more than you? You see, straight away, you know better than me. You can't understand this more than me. You understand? We have to be on the even plane. So this is the tendency. But in reality, we live very, very different lives. As well, with, with Schopenhauer's judgment. But I suspect um, and I don't think I've, 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 I would have read this, but I suspect uh, in between the lines he could have um, placed architecture so low down because it has to have function. Right. And and you know I think that that's that would be a valid reason. Can I just say something is more beautiful if it's got both where it's got a function and it also looks good. It's like two birds, one stone. <laughs> okay. Right. One thing that I didn't mention, and it's very important, I don't know why I mean, because I thought probably everybody knows, is that for Schopenhauer, art has to be purposeless. Art is purposeless, right? It cannot have a purpose. So this, we have that in Lard Pur Lard, right? So purposeless, art has to be purposeless. When he talks about beautiful, he also talk, talks about uh, things that cannot be painted or made into sculpture because they will cause a purpose. For example, he says, you cannot have extremely tasty dishes on the table painted and wine and cheese and oysters and, and meat and that because when people look at it, they're going to feel, oh, I like that because I'm hungry now, right? So they have a purpose. He says, that's not art. That cannot be art. He would say, you cannot have a, nude, uh, a naked woman because it will, be, it will arouse something else. The will, you should be will-less in order to enter the idea. You cannot like the picture because it's a sexy woman, a beautiful body or something. That kills the art, he said. This is completely opposite than aesthetic contemplation. <laughs>